Anyone in here ever lose their keys? Come on, you know you did. Just say amen or something. <laughs> Let me start this way by reading a passage of Scripture from Psalm 8. This is David reflecting on what it means to be human. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is a human being that you are mindful of us? What is a son of a human being that you care for them? Yet you have made us a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned us with glory and honor. You've given human beings dominion over the work of your hands. You've put all things under their feet, sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That is a really high and lofty vision of what it means to be human. How do we get from that? to the place where we're losing, oh, they're there, yeah. I knew they were in one of these pockets, where we lose these keys. These are my keys, these are really important to me, not just for the key, but more importantly is my dog tag. That thing's been traveling the world with me for 46 years. It's got a lot of stories. I don't even care about the key, but don't lose that thing. So this shows you how long I've had those. So I've never lost my keys. I have misplaced them many, 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 many times. But ultimately, so far anyway, they've all come back. So we're in this series called Practicing the Ordinary, based in part on this book, The Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Harrison Warren. It's not the kind of book that I normally buy, which is precisely why it's really good for me, because it pushes me into thinking about things in different ways. And I really love that. I love her perspective. So today the chapter is titled Losing Keys. Let me just read how she starts this out, see if you can relate. I have a plan for my morning. Run by the store to pick up a side for dinner and some dish soap, but then I'll head to a meeting. So after I brush my teeth and help Jonathan get the kids off to their activities, I get dressed quickly, eat breakfast, I throw on my favorite corduroy coat, I hoist my computer bag over my shoulder, and I head to the door. I go to grab the car keys on the entry table that we bought and painted robin's egg blue for the express purpose of having a spot for our keys. Next to the jar of dried lavender and stack of mail are two key rings that hold the keys to the car, the house and our neighbor's house, as well as a couple of other keys, the purpose of which I've forgotten, but I keep holding on to them because you never know. <laughs> Cue the sound of screeching brakes. The keys aren't there. I check the side packet of my box, pocket of my bag, then the pants I wore yesterday, then my bag again. I start to panic a little. I take off my coat. I walk into my kitchen and I look on the counter. I have lost my keys. With them goes all sense of perspective. With them goes my plan. With them goes my cool. These instruments that I use for security and freedom to lock out the bad guys and get where I need to go have suddenly become a means of imprisonment. I'm stuck. Where could they be? I go through my stages of searching for lost objects. Stage one, logic. I retrace my steps. I look in the places that make sense. I breathe. I try to remain calm and rational. This is not that big of a deal. They'll turn up. Stage two, self-condemnation. As I make my way through each room, scanning shelves and services, I begin to self-flagellate under my breath. I am such an idiot. Where did I put those keys? Why am I such an idiot? Stage three, vexation. Such a good word. I get frustrated. I curse. Each second that passes leaves me slightly angrier. I switch back and forth between blaming myself and blaming others. My kids, they probably played with them and lost them. Did Jonathan take them? I text him. No help there. God must know where my keys are. Why isn't he helping here? I'm having a mild theological crisis over a two-inch piece of metal. Stage four, desperation. 
I start looking everywhere, even places that don't make sense. I'm rummaging through random drawers, looking under beds, checking the pants pockets that I've already checked three times, grumbling. I check the time. It's been nine minutes. Stage five. Last ditch. I stop and pray. Okay, breathe. I tell myself that I'm being ridiculous. I'm overreacting. Calm down. I quickly ask God for a restoration of perspective. I remember that a Catholic friend once told me to ask St. Anthony to pray for us when we've lost something. So, for good measure, I murmur as I check my sock drawer, uh, St. Anthony, not sure how this works, but if you can hear me, can you please pray for me to find my keys? Stage six. Some of you are going, wow, there's some cool stages in there. I need to add that to my practice. Stage six, despair. I give up and plop on the couch. I will never find my keys. The cause is hopeless. I am hopeless. I will be trapped here until the end of time or until we shell out the money to replace them. Outside the window by my locked car, naked trees and hopping sparrows, but I will not notice. Everything is worthless. The morning is ruined. Stupid keys, stupid me, stupid planet, stupid universe. Then, a bit ashamed and guilty about my overreaction, I pull myself together and beginning at step one, I repeat the cycle. Seven minutes later, I find my keys under the couch. I have no idea how they got there. I yelp to no one in particular, I found them! Cue the Alleluia chorus. I've actually done that thing. Hallelujah! I will quickly move on. Out the driveway, skip the grocery store, and head straight to the meeting. My lost keys ended up being a hiccup in the day. No big deal, a tiny forgettable 15 minutes. But it was also the apocalypse. Apocalypse literally means an unveiling or an uncovering. In my anger, grumbling, self-berating, cursing, doubt, and despair, I glimpsed for a few minutes how tightly I cling to control and how little control I actually have. And in the absence of control, feeling stuck and stressed, those parts of me that I prefer to keep hidden were momentarily unveiled. And that is the power of practicing the ordinary. Finding out something about myself. What about the ordinary practices of my day give rise to certain emotions? What about losing my keys gives rise to a certain way of thinking, a certain mental attitude? What about the frustrations that I will inevitably face in any given day give rise to certain behavior that I later on, upon reflection, think, ah, that wasn't my best stuff. Just lost my keys. And all of us have done that. All of us have done that. The challenge is that for me and for all of you, we have this illusion that out from me goes this order of control. And I can control my universe if I'm practical and pragmatic and have integrity and manage my Outlook calendar and put my keys in the lavender pot on the blue vase next to the door. Then all will be in order and in control. But it doesn't work that way. As a pastor in the western suburbs for over 35 years, as an executive coach with some amazing people, thousands of them over 35 years, I can tell you that all of them, and me too, down deep have a story that we're living out of that says the universe should work this way. And if I'm operating in that universe in the way that I should work, then all things should work well. Things should just go up and to the right. My 401k should be higher tomorrow than it is today because I invested with the right strategy. And gasoline should never go as high as it is because if my guy was in charge, it would be better. Except that you don't apply that when it went better because the other guy who was before your guy did it and no, then it's not the same math that you use. And it's the illusion of control. 
couple of weeks ago, I was on a plane doing a lot of that these days. Enjoy it, getting out to different places in the United States, hanging out with clients. But there's something that happens when you travel on a plane at least once a week. Sooner or later, you stack up 50 weeks of travel, 50 different cities, 50 different terminals. That makes it, you know, 100 flights because you've got to get back sooner or later. Sooner or later, sooner or later, it's not going to go your way. And so, a couple weeks ago, sitting on a plane, and the pilot came on and said, you know what, we almost made it out before the storm. But we did not. And so hours and hours and hours later, we made it out. But about two and a half, three hours in, there was sheer anger, frustration on that plane because all of us important people had places to go, things to do, and people to see, don't you know? And it was somebody's fault because when your illusion of control breaks down, you got to demonize somebody and idolize somebody else. If I'd have just bought my tickets on that other airline, and then you look out the window and that airline stuck too. Because the pilot said, storm. So I'm sitting next to this guy, and he's frustrated and ticked off. And about three hours in, I said, do you fly a lot? Well, this is my third or fourth time. Ha, 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 ha. Wait. And I showed him my phone. I said, see, this is a weather map. This says tornado warnings. How many of you want a really good pilot when you fly? Some of you don't want a really good pilot. You don't even care about the illusion of control. You'll just get on any old plane. Good for you, not me. I want a really good pilot. How many of you want your really good pilot, the best pilot, to fly through tornadoes? Nobody wants to fly through a tornado, I guarantee you. I don't care how good you are. You don't fly through tornadoes. Tornadoes are bigger than a plane. They take the plane and go, Bzzz, look, a little frisbee, cool. And you and I all know that you can't control the weather. So I'm glad that that pilot had the sense to say, I'm not going anywhere. I don't care how many of you get mad at me. So I'm talking to this guy. So let me give you a little perspective. Let me tell you a story. Several years ago, when my wife and I were flying to Papua New Guinea, when my daughter lived there, that's four flights. It's about 27, 28 hours in the air, wheels up. 36 to 40 hours of total flight time. Four different airports. So on our way back, we're flying from Brisbane to L.A., which is, I don't know, somewhere around a 12, 13, 14-hour flight. That's a long flight. So we get on the plane, and it takes off on time. Yay, team. And we're about four hours out over the Pacific. How many of you have flown over the Pacific? It makes the Atlantic Ocean look like a puddle. It's like big. Like if you have a globe, spin it to just the Pacific and you can't see it. You see a little bit of land cropping up. The Pacific is big. Thousands of miles across. So we're flying from Brisbane to L.A., which means we're over water the whole time. And about four hours in, I'm sitting there reading. And all of a sudden, I feel the plane going. I'm like, wait, what's he doing? Like, are, is, you got a big cloud you're turning around or what? You hang on a left at uh, the Pacific, this wave or something? What are you doing? The pilot comes on and says, you know, a couple of lights have gone on on the dashboard. Everything's going to be okay. They're not real serious. But to ensure your safety, we got to have them go checked out. And it's actually faster for us to go back four hours to Brisbane than it is to keep going another seven or eight hours to L.A. So we're going back to Brisbane. Four more hours with the lights glowing. <laughs> like, okay. Control. Control. It just doesn't make sense. Sooner or later, you have to admit that you are not in control. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do your best to plan. And Yes, have the bull by the door so you can find your keys, all that. But sooner or later, you have to think of different ways of operating in this world. And so this book is really good at that. Let me read 
Something else that happened to her that I think is instructive because then it gets into the theology of how we think about this. Sometimes my days run smoothly. Like ticker tape, they hum along, pleasant enough, productive at times. My plans, for the most part, uninterrupted. And then something small happens, the slightest tear in the tape, and the whole thing halts and becomes an unbidden morality tale. The neediness and sinfulness, neurosis and weakness that I try to pretty up and manage through control, ease and privilege are suddenly on display. A few weeks ago, the dryer, the dishwasher and the ceiling fan all broke within a few hours. Talk about an existential crisis. Most of my adult life, I have had neither a dryer, we used a clothesline or the laundromat, nor a dishwasher, we did the dishes by hand, nor ceiling fans, we have air conditioning. But when they all broke simultaneously, it felt like the universe had me on some kind of hit list. I took it personally. I know no one in here has ever done that. Small things go wrong. I feel hurried or overwhelmed, burdened by sad news or worried by a friend. And like a rising flood, inch by inch by inch, the collective sadness and frustration mounts and I snap. I yell at my daughters to quiet down. I slam the broken dishwasher door just a bit harder than necessary. I mutter something under my breath. And if I were a lioness, I would snarl. As it is, I brood. These unbidden unveilings in my day are insignificant compared to the immense suffering in our lives and in the broader world. There are people who face profound agony every day, chronic pain, heart-wrenching loss, desperation. In my own life, there have been seasons of deep sorrow, But this is not that. This is not the valley of the shadow of death. This is the roadside ditch of broken things and lost objects, the potholes of gloom and unwanted interruptions. That's pretty good. The unwanted interruptions of ordinary life. So what I'd like to do is just offer us three optics, three ways of looking at these little ordinary moments of losing your keys or dishwashers going out. The first one is what I call bottom-up theology, looking at these problems and looking up. The second way is a top-down theology, looking from heaven's perspective. And then the third way is what I'll call sideways theology, looking in from a very human, flat perspective. She goes on to talk about how this is an invitation to talk about these deep existential things. In Christian theology, it's called theodicy, explaining how you have a God who's all good, all loving, all knowing, and all powerful, and yet you have bad things that happen. And you might think, well, losing your keys doesn't scale up to that level. Yeah, it does. Why do I have a key in the first place? Why not just have doors that are unlocked? Why not just have a car that's unlocked that I could say, hey, Suri, start the car. I guess some of you have that. It's got to know your voice. Why do I need a key to unlock my front door. Don't the people who don't live there know that they shouldn't go in and take things that don't belong to them? I have keys in the first place because we live in a screwed up, messed up universe. This little key fob for my little Jeep has this red button called panic. Why did they think that it would be a good thing to have a panic button on my keys in case I get out to the parking lot and some bad guys want to do bad things to me? Unless you use it to find your car in the parking lot. (laughs) Like, I don't do that, but I've heard that some people do. Because, you know, losing your keys is one thing. Losing the car is another. Theodicy, how do we deal with the despair? How do we handle it when... Our sense of contentment is broken and we can't fix it and it gets bigger than losing car keys. What about the shame that sets in and the control and the fear and the frustration? What about all those things? How do I deal with a world that just doesn't work the way I think it should if God is all good, all knowing, all loving, and all powerful? And she teases us with a little bit of an intro to Job. Let me go a little bit deeper. This is what I call theology from the bottom up. There's a book in the Old Testament, if you've not read it, you should. It's called The Black Hole of All Theology. Sometimes Christians get stuck on a Theology 100, which says, you know what, the world should just be nice and happy, and if it's not, something's broken. Let's scale it up to a Theology 400. That's what Job is. 
Because Job, the Bible says, is the most righteous man in all the East. And he's out minding his own business, being all the things that he does that are good. And he's very wealthy. And one day he loses it all. Like a bunch of kids, seven of them, and their spouses. And he loses his farm, and he loses his ranch, and he loses his wealth. And he loses his status, he loses his clothes. And you get to the end of chapter 3, and he's standing in an ash heap that used to be his four-bedroom, three-bath, two-car garage house on the perfect salt cul-de-sac. Only it's not there anymore, it's burned down. And he's got a piece of pottery that's broken in his hand, and he's scraping the boils because calamity of all calamities has happened to him. And his wife comes along and says, Dude, she probably didn't say dude, but... If I were there, I would have coached her to say, dude, dude, Job, what's wrong with you? Curse God and die. It doesn't get worse than this. And Job essentially says, shall we accept good from the hand of the Lord and not evil as well? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then it takes another 37, 38 chapters for Job to argue with Three and then four friends who come with all the right Sunday school theology. You know, you must have done something wrong to deserve this. And Job's like, you're crazy. Job actually takes God to court. Files an oath of innocence, which in the ancient world meant, listen, unless the gods show up and prove me wrong, I am going to stand here and claim my innocence. And Job does that. At the end of all these arguments that God has or that Job has with his three friends. At the end of that, God comes to him in a whirlwind, and Job chapter 42 says that I, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes see you. I'm experiencing you now. And then it's this weird translation, which some translators, to make it all cleaned up, translate as the word repent, I now repent in dust and ashes. But that's not what it says. That same Hebrew word in every other context is translated as the word relent. There is a difference between relent and repent. Job gets to the end of his argument with God and he relents. He's like, I cry uncle. Can I get a fair hearing in your universe? And the reason we know that that's accurate is because God says to him, unless you come to me and you offer a sacrifice for your friends who got it all wrong, I will not forgive them. So God has already said, Job, some things you said about me that were a little rough, but I get it. They're right. And to maintain your sanity as a human being. And Job ends in a stalemate. And sometimes I just need to say, you know what, Lord? This universe is messed up. And if you're all good, all loving, all powerful, all kind, all wise, I don't get how it can continue to be so messed up. I don't get how gas prices are going up. I don't get January 6th. I don't get Black Lives Matter. I don't get Roe v. Wade. I don't get the Supreme Court. I don't get election stuff. I don't get 401ks. I don't get the meltdown in cryptocurrency. I don't get it all. And that's just the top 10 off the top of my head that I can think about. I could add 100 more, and pretty soon you got this knot of complexity that I cannot solve, and neither can you, and neither can your favorite guy. Because there's something wrong in the world, something broken. I hear sometimes Christians say, God is in control. I beg to disagree. God is much more than that. God is sovereign. And to be sovereign is that he gives us control and steps back and waits and waits and waits. And Jesus said he'll come back one day. And until he does... There will be messed up things happening in this world. Jesus said that himself. In this world, you will have tribulation. And that's a theology from the bottom up. Sometimes I just have to go look for my keys and find them and go, Lord, I don't understand why the universe works this way. But I can't stay there. Sometimes I need to go to the theology from the top down. What is the perspective of heaven? What is the perspective of heaven? Perspective of heaven, Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 15, one of my favorite passages in all scripture. There are three stories in a row that essentially make the same point. 
Whenever you have a Jewish rabbi telling you the same thing three times, he's essentially saying, pay attention. No, no, I, I really mean pay attention. No, I mean put down your phone, stop looking at Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Pay attention, because this matters more than anything you're about to hear from someone else. And he tells a story about a sheep herder who loses a sheep. Sheep herder is out one day, he's got a flock of sheep that's 100, and he goes, 96, 97, 98, 99. Where's 100? 97, 98, 99. <sighs> Number 100 got out again. That rascal, oh! Takes the 99, puts them in a pen. Puts a fence around them. You guys are all good. And then he goes out into the Judean wilderness where there are scorpions and snakes and lions and bad things to go find the sheep because the one sheep matters. And he finds the sheep, puts it on his shoulders, comes back, yay, there's a party. Then Jesus ups the game. He's like, okay, let me tell you another story that makes the same point. There was a woman who lost some coins well, what she essentially did was lost about 10% of her wealth. How many of you, if you had piles of cash representing your wealth, and you went to count it, you went, seven, eight, nine, wait, there's supposed to be 10 piles. Where's my 10th pile? You'd be like leaving right now. Pastor Glenn, I'll catch the rest of your message on YouTube right now. I gotta go find my cash. And she does. She goes all through the house in her search for the lost cash. And she finally finds it and says, oh, that's a relief. And there's a celebration. And then Jesus looks over his shoulder and there's a bunch of religious guys there going, yeah, so what's your point? <laughs> Which is not a way to taunt Jesus when you're listening to him teach because he's like, okay, I got one more. <laughs> there was a father and a son. And the son was the pride of the father. But one day the son grew up and said, I'm tired of your western suburban nonsense. I don't want it anymore. I don't want to go to a Naperville school anymore. I don't want the career that you had planned for me. Give me my portion of the inheritance. Bye. And then takes off for the Vegas of Israel. I know, you guys go there just for the shows. It's all good. Bless you. <laughs> he goes off to Sin City and what does he do? He spends everything on substances, on experiences, things that would make your toes curl and your eyes blush. And finally, he's out of cash. And he's sitting in the back of a restaurant eating the slops from the garbage. And he says, you know, <laughs> the folks that work for my dad, they have it better than this. I think I'll go back and see if I can be a servant. And he's walking home, and what does he see? And what happens in the story that Jesus is telling? Jesus says, here's the father on tiptoes, looking, waiting. <gasps> My son, yes! Get out the best party food. Break open the barbecue. Get that really cool robe, put it on him. I got this ring I want him to wear. My son who is lost is now found. And the scripture says that the angels in heaven party. That's called party sacred. I told a bunch of high school kids this once. I was speaking to that group and I said, there is a party hat with your name on it in heaven. They like that metaphor. That's the view from the top down. It doesn't matter how many times you lose your keys. It doesn't matter how many times all those things in your life go wrong. It does not matter how many times you can never be outside the love of God. Paul says, who can separate us from the love of God? And then he gives this list, which is intended to be a starter list, because you can keep adding to it. There's nothing you can put on the list that will separate you from the love of God. You can be outside the will of God, but never outside the love of God. And that's top down. But sometimes, I get weary of just wrestling with the big existential issues. And I love the top-down approach, but I've heard it before. Sometimes I need to take the sideways-in approach. And here's what I mean by that. The Apostle Paul, writing a letter to a church at Corinth, says this. 
If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, if I can move mountains, but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but if I don't have love, I got nothing, zip nada. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And then he finishes this chapter with, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Here's how to apply that, though, that I think is going to be a little different for you. I'll get accused of heresy for this, which is perfect. Jesus picking up on the Jewish Shema, which was a thousand years before he got here, which says that Israel should say this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor Wait, I didn't hear that part. And love your neighbor. You know, I, I didn't hear this. This right? edge in your neighbor. See, we fail miserably there. Even on my best day, I can apply my theology of love to all of you. I should love you. Yes, I should. Please remind me of that. And I should think through these big issues. Yes, I should. Those are all good things. And I should do my best to try to make the world better than how I found it. Yes, I should. But I am human. And according to Psalm 8, I am created at the apex of God's creation. When God looked out at his creation, it wasn't just the Grand Canyon and the Pacific Ocean that he had in mind when he said, you know what, it's good. No, it's very good. He had human beings created in his image. What if you took this passage and you read it standing in front of the mirror? What if you looked at the person that you see in the mirror and you said, love is patient, love is kind. Love doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. What if I return some of the grace that God has extended to me to me in those little everyday moments? What if I learn to practice self-care and self-love because Jesus commanded it? So friends, theology from the bottom up, from the top down, from the sideways in, whatever is most helpful to you. And sometimes, here's my final point. Sometimes when you lose your keys... It's just good to have a spare. (laughs) Let's pray. Lord God, it's a strange world. When we lose our keys, or when we contemplate why there is so much evil and suffering, sometimes when we remember that you love us so much that you came for us, sometimes we need to remind it that we are created in your image and we need to extend some grace, some love, some kindness, some gentleness to the person who we see in the mirror. Lord God, thank you for all your love for us in those everyday moments. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.